Good afternoon. On behalf of the International Law Students Association, our co-host, the American Society of International Law, and the sponsor of the International Rounds, Shearman and Sterling, welcome to the Shearman and Sterling World Championship Jessup Cup Round of the 2004 Shearman and Sterling International Rounds of the Philip C. Jessup International Law Moot Court Competition. <laughs> This has been an amazing week. 94 teams, 192 matches, 23 advanced matches, 183 judges, 45 bailiffs, countless volunteers, 75 national administrators, over 2,000 volunteers worldwide, and this is where we've come. This has been the finest year of my three years as executive director, and for that, I thank you all. I'd like to take, an take this opportunity to introduce the two teams that will be competing in the championship round. As applicant, we have team number 757. Arguing for the applicant today is Frederick Ryan Castillo and Justine Adrian Guerrero. Other members of the team are Andrew Fournier, Amy Dabu, Ryan Mancera, and they are coached by Sylvia Jo Sabio. Arguing for respondent is team number 359. The oralists will be Jaikant Shankar, Melanie Chin Ai Ling. Other members of the team include Joffrey Lim Kwan Hyung, Ramesh Selvarej, and the team is coached by Robert Beckman. Our bailiff is David Rosino. You can refer to your program for a full biography, but the two associate judges or junior judges on this panel will be Judge Maureen Harding Clark of the International Criminal Court and Judge Fausto Pokar of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Presiding uh, and sitting as president, is Professor M. Sharif Bassiouni. At this time, I'll flag down the bailiff and we'll start the round. Good luck to both of you. The International Court of Justice is now in session. Your distinguished <coughs> panel consists of President Bassiouni and the Honorable Judges Clark and Pokar. Be seated. Applicant may proceed. Mr. President, my excellencies, good afternoon. May it please the court. My name is Ryan Castillo, first agent for the applicant, the Kingdom of Arkham. Your excellencies, the last century bore witness to the most unimaginable atrocities committed against mankind. Genocide war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Applicant comes before the court today mindful that the gravest human rights violations must be stopped and impunity for these crimes must not be allowed. These matters, Your Excellencies, are not in dispute. Rather, at the heart of today's controversy is the issue of jurisdiction. May Randolph a surrender to the International Criminal Court the nationals of a non-party state to the room statute against its objection and in contravention of treaty law, custom, the United Nations Charter, and the room statute itself. 
I, as first agent, shall discuss applicant submissions relating to Joseph Kerwin, set out in paragraph 31A of the Compromis, while my co-agent shall discuss our submissions relating to Dr. Herbert West. We respectfully reserve 22 minutes and 20 minutes, respectively, for our presentation and three minutes for rebuttal. Your Excellencies, applicant submits that it would be illegal under international law for Andolke to surrender Kerwin to the ICC for three reasons. First, the ICC's exercise of jurisdiction over a national of a state not a party to the Rome Statute is in violation of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and customary international law. Second, Excuse me, Council, in what way is it a violation of the Vienna Convention and customary international law? Your Excellencies, it violates Article 34 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, or the principle of pacta perti is nec nocent, nec prosunt. Under Article 34, Your Excellency, a treaty does not create rights or obligations for a state not a party to the treaty. And allow me, Your Excellencies, to discuss my first submission on how Randolph's proposal would violate the Vienna Convention. Your Excellencies, at the outset, it's clear in paragraphs 9 and 30 of the Compromis that Arkham is not a party to the Rome Statute. Therefore, Randolph's insistence in subjecting the applicant to the terms of the said treaty violates the Vienna Convention, which recognizes the universal acceptance of the principles of free consent, sovereign equality, and independence of states in the regulation of treaty obligations. It cannot be proffered, Your Excellencies, that the Rome Statute imposes obligations only on individuals and not third states. Articles 18 and 19 of the Rome Statute impose a mandatory obligation on a non-party state, in this case, ARCOM, to object to ICC admissibility. And failing this, the ICC will divest that non-party state of its criminal jurisdiction over its nationals. Articles can I, 19. Can I ask you, did you make that argument before the ICC? Your Excellencies, as can be seen from paragraph 9 and 30 of the Compromis, the Kingdom of Arkham does not recognize the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. But did you still not think it appropriate at some stage to make an argument when you were notified in relation to objection to jurisdiction? No, Your Excellencies, this is precisely applicants' convention that for us to protect our national sovereignty and sovereign equality, Your Excellencies, Kingdom of Arkham should not be burdened to appear before the ICC to provide information that is genuinely investigating or prosecuting the case. Under Articles 19, Paragraph 5, and Article 19, Paragraph 4, Your Excellencies, the Kingdom of Arkham should make an objection at the earliest possible opportunity. It must provide information that it is genuinely investigating or prosecuting a case prior to or at the commencement of the trial. If it fails to do so, Your Excellencies, the Rome Statute will only limit the limit or the objection of the Kingdom of Arkham to the doctrine of Nabis in them under Article 17, Paragraph 1C of the Rome Statute. Thus, Your Excellencies, the ICC invades the sovereign prerogatives of states. Counsel, before you proceed, uh, consider this hypothetical. Um, a, a national of your country is on vacation uh, in a country we will call X, while he is in country X. Country Y, pursuant to an extradition treaty between X and Y, seeks the extradition of your national. Can you object to that extradition on the grounds that you have no extradition treaty with country Y? No, Your Excellencies. In that hypothetical case, Your Excellencies, our national or that individual should be subjected to the laws of that country, namely country X. And we do not object to this, Your Excellencies, on that ground. Your Excellencies, we recognize that Randolph has obligations under Articles 86 to 89 of the Rome Statute, and we do not contest this. However, Your Excellencies, insofar as Article 12 extends its application to a non-party state, Your Excellencies, in saying that provided the prerequisites or preconditions, meaning the state of nationality or the state of territoriality is a party to the Rome Statute, then automatically the ICC has jurisdiction. This is precisely the object of our objection, Your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, there are only two exceptions to the Pacta Tertius rule, but both are likewise wanting in the present case. First, a stipulation for a twee cannot apply given Arkham's unequivocal refusal to sign or ratify the treaty. Second, Your Excellencies, neither does the Rome Statute embody custom or a use cogent norm so as to bind a third state under Articles 38 and 53 of the Vienna Convention. Uh, Council, don't the uh 
three crimes within the jurisdiction of the ICC uh, require states to prosecute or extradite and provide for universal jurisdiction? Yes, Your Excellencies, but here we must distinguish between the exercise of universal jurisdiction by states and what the Rome Statute proposes, which is the collective delegation of universal and territorial jurisdiction to an international criminal court. This finds no precedent whatsoever in the past four international tribunals of Nuremberg, Tokyo, Rwanda, and Yugoslavia. Your Excellency Snyder State Practice, no opinion. Excuse me, are you saying that the tribunal at Nuremberg was not a collective decision? It was a collective decision, Your Excellencies. But the jurisdictional basis of Nuremberg, as well as in Tokyo, Your Excellencies, rested on the express consent given by the defendant state of nationality. Similarly, Your Excellencies, the jurisdiction... rested on the consent of, uh, respectively, Germany and Japan? Your Excellencies, in the case of Germany, the four occupying powers, namely the United States, Britain, France, and Russia, were the effective sovereign powers who gave that consent for that territory now we know as Germany. In the case of Tokyo, Your Excellencies, it is clear in the Potsdam Declaration, as well as in the 1951 San Francisco Peace Treaty waiver, that indeed the government of Japan waived and agreed to the consensus, to the consent of that jurisdictional basis of the Nuremberg with the Tokyo Tribunal. Your Excellencies, if we examine on whether or not the room statute is customary, especially Article 12, the conclusion is in the negative. Even the final vote on the adoption of the room statute would reveal that one-fourth of all states who attended the Rome Conference either abstained from, rejected, or did not accept the treaty. At present, 113 states, or about 56% of all states in the world, are not parties to the treaty. In fact, more than one-third of all states who signed the treaty have not ratified the same. This evinces that the elements of uniformity, duration, and generality of state acceptance have not been established. Counsel, are you familiar with the European Convention on Transfer of Criminal Proceedings? Yes, Your Excellencies. Um, assume that uh, a country has entered uh, this convention and has uh, seized a national of a non-state party um, and in pursuance of that convention transfers the person to another state party to the European Convention. Would you claim that this is a violation of international law? No, Your Excellencies, but we must distinguish, Your Excellencies, that in the European Convention, the transnational proceeding, Your Excellencies, the consent was given by a state, and the exercise of jurisdiction is made by another state. Here, Your Excellencies, the consent of the state, here a non-state party, was not even sought, or Your Excellencies even given by the state or non-party state. That distinguishes, Your Excellencies, those two tribunals or those two examples. Your Excellencies, on the contrary, applicant now asserts jurisdiction on the basis of the nationality principle. And even Randolphia admits to the effectiveness of acceptance of the, universal, of the nationality principle as can be envisaged in paragraph 13 of the clarifications, as Randolphian law permits it to prosecute its own citizens for certain crimes committed even outside its territory. Thus, on the one hand, applicant's assertion of jurisdiction on the basis of the nationality principle finds ample support under international law. On the other hand, Randolph's disregard of the Pacta Tertis rule is a clear violation of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and customary international law. The Excellencies, if I may proceed to my second submission. Thank you, sure. Mr. President and Your Excellencies. Security Council Resolution 2241 imposes binding obligations on Randolphia to respect Arkham's exclusive jurisdiction over Kerwin. Allow me to pose two questions, Your Excellencies. First, does the Security Council have the competence to describe Resolution 2241, in particular Operative Paragraph 7, so as to bind Randolphia? And second, is Operative Paragraph 7 a reasonable and lawful exercise of the Council's powers? On the first level, Your Excellencies, Article 24, Paragraph 1 of the UN Charter provides that the Security Council is vested with the primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. And towards this end, Article 39, in relation to Articles 40, 41, and 42 of the UN Charter, vests in the Security Council the power to determine the existence of a threat to peace and to prescribe measures to carry out its mandate. And Your Excellencies, in a long line of cases, this honorable court has consistently upheld the validity of Security Council resolutions and their binding character on all Union member states. 
This can be senior excellencies from the Lockerbie incident, the Genocide Convention case, certain expenses case, Namibia, and Nicaragua. Pursuant to the United Nations Charter, Your Excellency, Serendolfia, being a member of that charter, must comply with Resolution 2241. Article 25 unequivocally provides member states agree to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the UN Charter. Council, are you suggesting that this court is not competent to review a decision of the Security Council? Yes, Your Excellencies, but we must distinguish. Your Excellencies, under Article 59 of this court statute, the decision of this court is only binding between the parties to it, meaning states. Under Article 34, Your Excellencies, only states may appear before the court. However, Your Excellencies, this court has opined by individual judges Shahabuddin, Viramantri, and Bijawi in the Lockerbie incident, Your Excellencies, have said that the Security Council's power and discretion is not unlimited, and applicants subscribe to this view. Therefore, Your Excellencies, we must distinguish or clarify whether or not Operative Paragraph 7 indeed conforms to the principles and purposes of the United Nations Charter. And allow me but if we accepted this proposition, wouldn't we be infringing upon the sovereignty of the Security Council in matters involving peace and security? No, Your Excellencies, in so far as this court under Article 36, Paragraph 1 and Paragraph 2, Your Excellencies, is empowered to determine the legal consequences and to determine any international legal question, Your Excellencies, for which the parties have set forth or have agreed to submit to the resolution of the ICJ, then this court has jurisdiction. And pursuant to Article yes, 1. Yes, excuse me. The question is not whether the court has jurisdiction with respect to the parties, but whether the court has the authority the pursuant to the charter to sit in judgment upon the validity or the extent of the authority of the Security Council in adopting a resolution within Chapter 7. No, Your Excellencies, the Charter does not provide for a power, or an explicit power, of a judicial review over Security Council resolutions. In fact, in 1945, in the Dumberton Oaks proposal, Your Excellencies, the Belgian proposal that the ICJ should have review of Security Council resolutions was heavily rejected. Your Excellencies, but if I may engage you, in determining the legal consequences as would bind both state parties in this case. Operative Paragraph 7 is consistent with the principles and purposes of the UN Charter. As can be seen from Paragraph 13 of the Compromis, the formation of IFLEN and the prescription of conditions for its operations was explicitly enacted by the Council under Chapter 7 of its powers. This was to address the serious threat to international peace caused by the nighttime raids in New York. Your Excellency's operative paragraph 7, granting exclusive jurisdiction to the state of nationality, is not a novel creation. In fact, Your Excellency's operative paragraph 7 is identical to the same operative paragraph 7 in SE Resolution 1497 and mirrors SE Resolutions 1422. And the grant. So, excuse me, how do you reconcile that with the obligation to prosecute under the principle of universality for such crimes as? genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Your Excellencies, there is no conflict because the grant of exclusive jurisdiction to the state of nationality comes with a concomitant duty to promote accountability for the most serious violations of international humanitarian law. Your Excellencies, if you examine operative paragraph 7 as can be gleaned in paragraph 13 and 14 of the Compromis, Your Excellencies, operative paragraph 7 grants exclusive jurisdiction to the state of nationality. In so far as it is consistent, with the field of United Nations practice, as evinced by Section 47B of the 1990 UN Model Status of Forest Agreement between the United Nations and contributing troops, Section 5 of the 1991 UN Agreement, and Section 4 of the most recent 1999 UN Bulletin by the Secretary General. The rationale, Your Excellencies, is to ensure the preservation and maintenance of United Nations operations, which are the very vital mechanisms to promote international peace and security. And there is no impunity, Your Excellencies, because precisely Operative Paragraph 7 puts the burden on the state of nationality to promote accountability measures. Assume, if you will, that the state of nationality does not exercise that responsibility. How would you achieve accountability? Your Excellencies, accountability is achieved because an effective remedy still exists. The state, of nation, the state of territoriality may espouse that claim, Your Excellencies, to the ICJ or to any other forum 
because the state of nationality in that scenario has failed to discharge its duty under international law. And we are not condoning, Your Excellencies, in any event, the acts of Joseph Kerwin. What we are merely saying at this stage, Your Excellencies, is that any determination as to Kerwin's guilt or innocence is a determination that the Kingdom of Arkham can and should be allowed to make. Isn't the key issue here your intention if your um, Mr. Cohen comes back to Arkham? Is it, is it your intention to make him accountable for the allegations? Yes, Your Excellencies, and the intention is manifest by our establishment of the Arcanian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which leads me, Your Excellencies, to my third submission. That the Arkham TRC is consistent not only with international humanitarian law, but even under the principle of complementarity as found in the Rome Statute as it exists and also as it exists under international law. Your Excellencies, applicant submits that the principle of complementarity must be stressed to be not a creation of the Rome Statute. It exists as a general principle of international law in that investigation and prosecution of genocide, war crimes, and other acts of crimes against humanity, Your Excellencies, must be primarily vested in national jurisdictions. Thus, Your Excellencies embodied under Article 1 and 17 of the Rome Statute, the ICC may only assume jurisdiction if a state having jurisdiction is either unwilling or unable to genuinely investigate or prosecute an accused. And are you saying that that's what Arkham intends to do by a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to genuinely investigate and prosecute? Yes, Your Excellency. How do you square that? Your Excellency's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, modeled after that of South Africa, promotes accountability mechanisms. First, Your Excellency, is modeled after the South African TRC and under the Promotion of National Unity and Reconciliation Act. Your Excellency, the TRC exercises jurisdiction over nationals and over individuals and can grant two things. It can grant amnesty or it can deny amnesty. And in such a grant or a denial of amnesty, Your Excellencies, prosecutions must ensue. And Your Excellencies, the threat of prosecuting the most serious violations of international humanitarian law is present under the South African model. In fact, more than 80% of amnesty applications under such a model have been denied and prosecutions thus follow. It is important to stress, Your Excellencies, at this point, that even the Rome Statute itself says that prosecution is not equivalent to accountability, and accountability is not the only means of pursuing your excellencies or pursuing the prosecution Council, of individuals. Council, do you understand you well uh, that uh, uh, it's the intention of Arkham to prosecute uh, the, uh, the, the person for uh, grave breaches of uh, Geneva Conventions, for war crimes, and not to grant amnesty? Yes, Your Excellencies. If indeed your Do you have a law to that effect? Indeed, Your Excellencies, it, may be, it must be presumed. In our legislation? Yes, Your Excellencies, if I may point you to paragraph 30 of the Compromis, it must be presumed that the Arkham is in compliance or under the doctrine of Pacas and Servanda is in compliance with its treaty obligations. And this paragraph 30 shows that we are signatories to the 1949 Geneva Conventions, Your Excellencies. Then we have presumably have enacted laws to this effect. Your Excellencies, at I, I don't think it, uh, I would like uh, evidence. It's not presumed that, that the legislation uh, implementing the Geneva Convention has been uh, adopted. Your Excellencies, I beg your indulgence as the compromise bereft of any facts. Okay. But however, Your Excellencies, Arkham is insisting and is asserting that it will prosecute Mr. Kerwin if indeed the facts of the case show that he committed great breaches of the genocide or the Geneva Convention. But, but Council, under your legislation, your TRC could also provide him with amnesty. Your Excellencies, under paragraph 7 of the Compromis, the grant of amnesty empowered to the TRC is only limited to acts committed during and in furtherance of the armed conflict. And Your Excellencies, any determination on whether or not Kerwin's acts fall within this mandate or fall within such a criteria is, too, is a premature action, Your Excellencies, that Trindovia may make today. Your Excellencies, amnesty is indeed valid under international law, provided that it's not, it is an internal armed conflict, and they do not approach the grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. Your Excellencies, under the South African model, under- Council, are you contending that um, violations of common Article 3 and Protocol 2 should be treated as lesser violations than grave breaches? No, Your Excellencies. In fact, common Article 3 has been recognized as customary international law. And we must protect civilians and innocent people, Your Excellencies, and the unwanted destruction of property. But until, Your Excellencies, the principles of, of 
proportionality and necessity laid down by the court in the Caroline case can be proven, Your Excellencies, then this determination that Kerwin indeed committed such war crimes is premature at this stage. Excuse me, Counsel. Uh, leaving aside the argument of proportionality, which I don't think applies here, but if, if you're saying that a grave breach is equivalent to a violation of common Article 3, and if you recognize that there is an obligation to prosecute assuming the facts warranted, how do you reconcile that with your TRC law that provides for an option of amnesty? Your Excellency's amnesty is valid under international law. Even Article 6, Paragraph 5 of Additional Protocol 2 of the 1949 Geneva Conventions allows for the use of amnesty. And that formation of TRCs, Your Excellencies, in the last three decades, there have been 16 tooth commissions across five continents applied in internal and international armed conflict, including United Nations sponsored ag ag amnesties or TRCs, including the case of El Salvador between the Farabundo Mati Liberation Army and the government of El Salvador. And Your Excellencies, this is the case here. Uh, Council, if I may just ask a statistical question, um, how come you statistically rely on 16 Truth Commission as being conclusive and you refuse to rely on the uh, uh, support of 121 countries for the ICC as being reliable? What statistical basis do you use to maintain these two positions? Your Excellency, seeing that my time is up, I may just, may just be allowed to answer that Please. question. Your Excellency is under the asylum case, and as well as the North uh, Anglo Fisheries case, Your Excellencies, the formation of custom need not be absolute, but it must indicate a substantial uniformity and generality to the states most affected. And Your Excellency is the fact that Latin America and countries such as Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, El Salvador, and Haiti, Your Excellencies, are the most interested states, in fact, the, the states which have encountered the most serious violations of international humanitarian law, provides the evidence that we must look, Your Excellencies, in the formation of Kosovo, not to the states who have not dealt with such an experience, but such states we have, which have dealt with serious violations of international law. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. President, Your Excellencies, may it please the court. Please proceed. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, good afternoon. May it please the court, I am Justin Adrian Guerrero, second agent for the applicant, the Kingdom of Arkham. Your Excellencies, my co-agent has discussed why the International Criminal Court cannot exercise jurisdiction over Joseph Kerwin. It is now my task to discuss why the International Criminal Court cannot likewise exercise jurisdiction over Dr. West. The same principles of nationality and Pacta Tertis, Nick Noche, Nick Prosum, as they apply to Kerwin, also apply to West. Moreover, the ICC can only exercise jurisdiction over persons whose acts constitute crimes within the coverage of the Rome Statute. My submissions consist, first, Dr. West's alleged acts do not constitute crimes within the jurisdiction of the ICC. Second, Dr. West and his alleged criminal conduct do not demonstrate the necessary nexus with the state party to the Rome Statute. And third, Dr. West's acts preceded the date upon which the Rome Statute entered into force for both Lane and Randolphia and are thus barred from the ICC's consideration. At this point, Your Excellencies, unless this court has any preliminary observations, I shall proceed to my first submission. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Applicant submits Dr. West's acts do not constitute crimes within the jurisdiction of the ICC. Your Excellencies, the ICC prosecutor charged Dr. West with incitement to genocide and attempted genocide, referring in particular to genocide as the act of killing members of a group with a specific intent to destroy, in whole or in part, the protected group as such. Your Excellencies, applicant acknowledges the tragedy that occurred in Yugo. However, vigorous efforts to vindicate human rights violations must equally be tempered with strict adherence to international law. Dr. West is charged with incitement to genocide and attempted genocide under the Rome Statute, both of which require the necessary genocidal intent. Such intent, or dolus specialis, 
requires that the perpetrator targeted the destruction of a group precisely because of their nationality, ethnicity, religious, or racial identity. Without a conclusive finding of this genocidal intent, there can be no incitement to genocide or attempt to genocide. But counsel, a conclusive finding is something that a trial court reaches after a trial. But uh, unless I'm mistaken in the compromis, there's a statement that uh, Dr. West uh, incited to the elimination uh, of a whole group of people. Uh, doesn't that on its face constitute a prima facie case? Your Excellencies, indeed, this court does not sit as a criminal court. However, Your Excellencies, it is applicant submission that even prima facie, the facts of the compromise reveal that Dr. West cannot be held liable for incitement to genocide or attempted genocide because the very essential element of this crime, the crime of genocidal intent, is absent in the case of Dr. West. Yes, Your Excellency. Counselor, are you uh, just uh, denying the existence of the uh, special intent or also of the actus reus? Your Excellencies, in this case, the actus reus, as well as the mens rea in the case of Dr. West, is wanting. But more important, Your Excellencies, is how the element. Say, how, has do you, how do you say that? You've just, um, the facts of the case and the compromise are that Dr. West um, prepared a tape which eventually found its way to be neutral into the local radio station where the people who were identified and targeted belonged to a particular group and not to anything else. Why do you say that the ingredients of the crime of genocide per se don't exist? Whatever about the merits of the case, we're just talking about the elements of the crime. How do you say they don't exist? Your Excellencies, Dr. West did indeed record a tape recording in paragraph 10 of the Compromis. However, Your Excellencies, this recording was done in the privacy of his home. Now, I'm not talking about the merits of the case, counsel. I'm talking about your argument that the ingredients of the crime of genocide don't exist. And you recited very accurately what the ingredients of the crime of genocide are. How do you say that they are absent in this case, leaving aside how the tape was recorded on why the tape was recorded. The targeted group who, who subsequently were killed belonged to one group and one group only. Indeed, Your, your Excellencies, it was the ethnic Lengans that were killed in the nighttime raids. However, Your Excellencies, they were not killed on account of their ethnicity, which is a prime requirement of the crime of genocide. Your Excellencies, we submit in the message of Dr. West when he uttered, eliminate them all, it was clearly followed by the statements to unify Yugot and Arkham, of which the Arcanian people have dreamed of forever. We submit, Your Excellencies, that taking into consideration the factual circumstances that Dr. West, in paragraph 8 and 10 of the Compromis, is one of the leaders of the Greater Arcanian Liberation Army, a secessionist movement dedicated solely to the secession of Yugot from Leng and its unification with Arkham that this is a matter of territorial dispute, Your Excellencies. And Dr. West's message simply echoed the goals of his organization and called to his fellow Arcanian brothers and sisters to unify you. So are you saying that in your country that you would consider this was not a crime at all? Your Excellencies, we are saying that prima facie, this was not a crime, or this is not a crime of genocide. However, Your Excellencies, should custody be surrendered to the Kingdom of Arkham, then rest assured, Your Excellencies, that the Kingdom of Arkham, in compliance with its obligations under the 1948 Genocide Convention, as well as the applicable provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, will investigate into the alleged involvement of Dr. West and will prosecute, Your Excellencies, if need be, into the involvement of Dr. West. But, Your Excellencies, this is a matter of territorial dispute, even as Respondent admits in page 13 of their memorial. In Counsel, are, yes, you, are you implying that the words that we find in the, in the videotape, uh, eliminate them all, uh, is just uh, instigating to a forcible deportation of people? Your Excellencies, we are implying that the words of Dr. West in the message do not reveal an intent to destroy the ethnic Lengyans on account of their ethnicity, but merely to secede the territory of Yugot from Leng. 
and to unify it with art, which is a goal of the gala and Dr. West, in prosecutor versus Kopreskic excellencies, decided by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in 2000. The court determined that the attacks on the village of Amici were part of a campaign to terrorize Muslims and to expel them from their territory. They were not aimed, Your Excellency, at destroying the Muslim group as such. Indeed, the court noted that the events in the village of Amici were one of the most vicious illustrations of man's inhumanity to man. And yet, in that case, as it is here, no genocide was committed. Your Excellencies, allow me to draw a parallelism between this case of Dr. West and the case of Ferdinand Nahimana, Jean Bosco Brayaguiza, and Hassan Nietzsche, or the media trial case decided by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in December of 2003. In that case, Your Excellencies, all three accused were learned individuals similar to Dr. West. Ferdinand Nahimana was a renowned academician and a professor of history at the National University of Rwanda. In that case, Your Excellencies, all three accused were well aware of the power of words and used the media with the widest possible reach to disseminate hatred and violence in Rwanda. The court, pertinently with respect to Ferdinand Nahimana, determined the presence of genocidal intent through the various statements and acts of the accused. In paragraph 966, 958, and 959 of that court's, yes, yes, no. 958 and 959 of that court's decision, Ferdinand Nahimana, as a mastermind behind RTLM, launched the communications weaponry that fought the media war as a complement to the bullets. Nahimana exhibited genocidal intent through broadcast of radio RTLM, airing calls for genocide, saying, dear listeners of RTLM, the war that we are waging is actually between these two ethnic groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis. We must all stand up to kill the Inkotani and exterminate them. The How reason- do you say that's any different from the situation that faces you now? How do you distinguish it? Your Excellencies, perhaps the statement of Nahimana after he said, let us exterminate them, he explicitly said, Your Excellencies, the reason we will exterminate them is that they belong to one ethnic group. As compared, Your Excellencies, to the statements of Dr. West, which said to unify Yugut with Arkham, which was a part of the greater Acadian homeland in paragraph 10 of the Compromis. Therefore, Your Excellencies, the various statements, acts, and messages of the accused in the Himana reveal or lead to the conclusion that membership in one ethnic group was the sole reason why the ethnic Tutsis were being targeted. So was it a coincidence then that the target of um, the speech on the radio were the Langians. Were they not a national or an ethnic group? They are, in, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Or were they just in the way? Your Excellencies, I understand your concern. The ethnic Langians are indeed an ethnic group, but they were not targeted because of their ethnicity, but because they were occupying, Your Excellencies, the territory of Yugot, which Arkham believes to be an integral part of the territory of Arkham. Therefore, Your Excellencies, in order to secede and annex the territory of Yugot back to Arkham, then Dr. West and Gala wanted to get rid, or Your Excellencies, to expel the ethnic Lanyans from the territory. Your Excellencies? Or exterminate. Your Excellencies, however, I understand your concern, but Your Excellencies, they were not exterminated because they were ethnic Lanyans. Harsh as it may sound, Your Excellencies, they believed that that territory of Yugot was theirs, and they wanted to secede it back to Arkham which is why Your Excellencies they wanted to expel the Lengians from that territory, just like Your Excellencies the Bosnian Croats wanted to expel or ex expel the Bosnian Muslims from the territory of Amici. Yes, sir. Counsel, uh, it seems to me that during the Nazi regime in Germany that the so-called final solution of the Jews was not to exterminate all of the Jews all over the world, but merely to exterminate all of the Jews in Germany. Would that make it less of a genocide in your <coughs> mind and based on your reasoning? Certainly not, Your Excellencies. However, in that example, in the final solution of Adolf Hitler, he precisely targeted the Jews because they were Jews, Your Excellencies. History has noted that Germany at the time was in hatred of the Jews of the Jew Jewish peoples, Your Excellencies. They hated them or they wanted to get rid of them because they were Jews. However, Your Excellencies, in this case, 
We are not contesting the geographical locality, and we admit, Your Excellencies, that geographical locality, our limited geographical zone, can, can result to a commission of genocide, as held in the case of prosecutor versus Jelicic. But, oh, but yes, yes. The target of the elimination, which Dr. West had in mind, was an identifiable group of people. Indeed, Your Excellencies, in paragraph 10 of the Compromis, the ethnic Lengyans were identified. However, Your Excellencies, in paragraph 11 of the clarifications, Yugot is made up of only ethnic Lengyans and ethnic Arcamians. Therefore, Your Excellencies, Dr. West and the Greater Arcamian Liberation Army only wanted to expel these ethnic Lengyans from the territory of Yugot, not because they were e ethnic Lengyans, Your Excellencies, but because they were occupying what Gala and Dr. West believed to be a part of their territory. So genocide becomes justified against an ethnic group if the purpose of their elimination Political. is merely Political. the removal of that group from the territory? Your Excellency, certainly not. In fact, Your Excellencies, in the case of Nahimana in paragraph 969, the court noted that genocide is never justified even if it, is, if it coincides with a political motive. However, Your Excellencies, in that case, the court explicitly noted that overall, Your Excellencies, or the, very, the overwhelming intent of the accused in that case was to target the ethnic Tutsis because of their ethnicity, which is absent, Your Excellencies, in the case of Dr. West. He is not espousing ethnic hatred. Gala is not espousing ethnic hatred but mere aims of territorial unity. And your ex- So, so can yes. I ask you, did you say any crime was committed at all, leaving aside the role of your national? Was any crime committed at all that would be of concern to the International Criminal Court? Your Excellencies, at most, Dr. West can be held liable for mass killings. However, Your Excellencies, this is not a crime within the competence of Article 5 of the Rome Statute. Therefore, custody over Dr. West Investigation and prosecution into his alleged involvement, Your Excellencies, should best with the territory of Arkham, or with the kingdom of Arkham. And Your Excellencies, I understand your concern, and we are not condoning the acts of Dr. West. And perhaps, Your Excellencies, more peaceful methods could have been employed by Dr. West and Gala. However, Your Excellencies, as this is a crime of genocide, and the necessary intent requirement is so high, no accused, Your Excellencies, should be accused of this crime absent the necessary genocidal intent. Your Excellencies, not only do Dr. West's acts fall outside the jurisdiction of the ICC, there is also no nexus between Dr. West and his acts on the one hand and a state party to the Rome Statute on the other, which leads me, Your Excellencies, to my second submission, unless, of course, this court has any further observations. Yes, just, just remind me again, was yes. he only um um, the charges which formed part of the, the um, request for an arrest warrant, were they, was there an alternative charge? Yes, Your Excellencies. The arrest warrant read that Dr. West is charged with incitement to genocide or attempted genocide. However, Your Excellencies, Dr. West is still not guilty of attempted genocide because there was no substantial step that Dr. West undertook to commit genocide. And more importantly, Your Excellencies, again, Dr. West had no genocidal intent. So, so, all so the yes, arrest sir. warrant, is that what I wanted to know? He wasn't charged alternatively with crimes against humanity, no? It's the arrest warrant is, or the proposed charges, which as you know are subject to change in the pretrial chamber, if it gets that far. But are you saying that he was only charged in relation to genocide, incitement, or committing genocide? and no alternative on crimes against humanity. Your Excellencies, in the Compromis, there is no charge against Dr. West for crime against humanity. Very He's good. charged. Very good. That's all I wanted. I couldn't find it, and I wanted to be reminded. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting you. Thank you, Your Excellencies. International law recognizes existing basis upon which a state may exercise criminal jurisdiction over individuals. Each base creates a tangible linking point with the alleged offender and the state. Under the principle of nationality, a state may exercise criminal jurisdiction over its offending nationals pursuant to the concept of state sovereignty. However, neither, doc, neither Randolphia nor Lang can justify their basis of jurisdiction on Dr. West because in paragraph 10 of the clarifications, Dr. West is a national, a resident, and a citizen of Arkham. 
Your Excellency is under the doctrine of territoriality. A state may exercise jurisdiction over acts which occur within its territory. However, as the acts of Dr. West are the only acts of recording and tendering the tape to his neighbor, then these acts, Your Excellencies, occurred in the territory of ARCA. And Your Excellencies, ARCA is not a state party to the Rome Statute. Your Excellencies, unless this court has any further... Marcel, don't you yes, think that it could have been foreseeable for Dr. West uh, that his tape would be diffused uh, broadcast as, uh, elsewhere? Your Excellencies, I believe... Did he gave you any instruction not to do that to his neighbor? Your Excellencies, in paragraph 10 of the Compromis, there is no evidence that Dr. West issued specific instructions as to what use, if any, should be made of the tape. However, Your Excellencies, if you are referring to the doctrine of a joint criminal enterprise under the case of Prosecutor versus Takic, decided by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in 2003, and reiterated in Prosecutor versus Vasiljevic in February 25 of 2004, the case, or the court, rather, Your Excellencies, in that case noted that for a joint criminal enterprise to exist, there must be three elements, namely, that the accused and another individual intended to commit a crime, or did commit a crime, and second, that there was a common intent, policy, plan, or design to commit a crime within the competence of the statute, and third, that the accused participated in such crime. From these elements, Your Excellencies, Dr. West and Gala do not form a joint criminal enterprise because their intent was to secede Yugot from Leng and to unify it with Arkham, not a crime within the jurisdiction of the ICC. But more importantly, Your Excellencies, in paragraph 530 of the Stockage decision, the court noted that a joint criminal enterprise is a mode of imputing liability which does not replace the core element of genocide. Therefore, Your Excellencies, it does not lower nor water down the threshold for this crime. Therefore, genocide as a foreseeable and natural consequence of an enterprise which does not specifically aim for genocide is incompatible with the definition of genocide under international law. Can I ask you, are you saying that the acts um, or the intent on the part of your country to invade the territory of another country, Lang, for the purpose of um, allowing it to join up with your country is a legal act, that it respects the sovereignty of Lang? Your Excellencies, allow me to clarify. In paragraph 11 of the clarifications, Arkham makes no claim over the territory of Yugo. Therefore, our country, or the kingdom of Arkham, has nothing to do with the goals of Gala. Your Excellencies, <coughs> seeing that my time is up, may I just have time to answer your question? Certainly. Thank you, Your Excellencies. However, Your Excellencies, we are merely saying that Gala and Dr. West wanted to secede the territory of Yugot from Arca, but not to eliminate the ethnic Lengans on account of their ethnicity. On that note, Your Excellencies, I end my... May I ask Your the President to add question? an additional question? Of course. Yes, yes. Uh, when we are talking of the joint criminal enterprise, were you meaning that uh, uh, since genocide that requires a specific intent, all the participants in the uh, joint criminal enterprise must have the specific intent? Is that your position? Yes, Your Excellencies. In pa paragraph 530 of the Stockage decision, the court explicitly noted that the joint criminal enterprise is a mode of imputing liability, which does not replace the core element of a crime. Therefore, Your Excellencies, Dr. West nor Gala did not have the intention to commit genocide. Don't you consider that the simple awareness of the participants that other participants may commit genocide will be sufficient? Your Excellencies, then that would go against the doctrine that genocide is strictly a crime of fault, and one cannot be held liable for possible consequences of such act. Therefore, Your Excellencies, even under a joint criminal enterprise, that mode of liability does not water down the threshold for genocide, and the participants must have the genocidal intent. Uh, thank you, Counselor. Your I position thank this is court for its time and indulgence. May it please the court. Thank you. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, good afternoon. My name is Jay Gan Shankar, and I appear as agent of the respondent in this case, the state of Randolphia. Appearing with me is my co-agent, Ms. Melanie Chim. Your Excellencies, the state of Randolphia seeks a declaration from this court that its decision to surrender the two accused persons, Joseph Kerwin and Herbert West, to the International Criminal Court would be consistent with international law. 
I will address the issues relating to Cohen and will speak for 22 minutes. My co-agent, Ms. Chung, will address the issues relating to West and will speak for 21 minutes. We have reserved two minutes of our time for Surrey Battle. Your Excellencies, Kerwin ordered the attack and destruction of an entire Lingen village, which was undefended. This resulted in the death of 200 unarmed men, women, and children. Kerwin has to be held internationally accountable for his grave conduct. Kerwin is at present in the custody of the state of Randolphia, and the International Criminal Court has issued an arrest warrant for him in accordance with the provisions of the Rome Statute. It is submitted that Randolphia's decision to surrender Cohen to the International Criminal Court would be consistent with international law. I have three arguments in support of my submission. First, the Security Council Resolution 2241 does not render Randolphia's decision to surrender Cohen to the ICC illegal under international law. Second, that the principle of complementarity embodied in Article 17 of the Rome Statute does not render the ICC's case against Cohen inadmissible as Arkham has not commenced any genuine investigation over him. And third, that the ICC. Does that make any difference? Does that make any difference? If Arkham is not a signatory country, does it make any difference whether they're going to prosecute her otherwise for complementarity? Your Excellency, it is the state of Randolph's decision to surrender Cohen to the International Criminal Court. If indeed Arkham is commencing a genuine investigation, they may avail themselves of the mechanism provided in Article 17 of the Rome Statute. Thus, Your Excellency, it is the state of Randolph's submission that Arkham has not evinced a serious intention to prosecute Joseph Cohen, and as such, they, they may not avail themselves of the principle of complementarity in the Rome Statute. Your Excellency, my third argument that the ICC's exercise of jurisdiction over Joseph Cohen is consistent with customary international law and the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, even though Cohen is a national of a non-party state. I will address each of these arguments in turn. Moving on to my first argument. Security Council Resolution 2241 mandated the deployment of a multilateral force IFLAN in Ling to quell the raids. It is acknowledged that the Security Council has a wide discretion in deciding what measures it shall adopt or recommend in discharging its primary duty of maintaining international peace and security. In fact, it is further acknowledged that the Security Council resolution benefits from a presumption of validity. This was stated in the 1962 decision of this court in the certain expenses case. However, Your Excellencies, what is undisputed is that the Security Council does have limits on its powers this can be seen from the Charter itself. Under Article 24 of the Charter, the Security Council has an obligation to act in accordance with the purposes and principles of the Charter. The Security Council is, thought, is thus not unbound by law, Your Excellencies. The Council it may not be unbound by law, but it has the sole prerogative of determining whether its action is within the law, isn't it? Your Excellencies, the Security Council has the sole prerogative in determining the existence of a threat to international peace and security. However, there is authority to suggest that the Security Council, in adopting these measures, may not contravene certain use cogent norms, Your Excellencies. In the present case, it is the state of Randolph's position that operative paragraph 7 could effectively lead to the impunity of perpetrators of grave crimes of concern to the international community, Your Excellencies. Isn't that speculation? Certainly, Your Excellencies. However, what must be stressed, that operative paragraph 7, while on its face, may not exempt persons from criminal responsibility, the application of operative paragraph 7 in the present case would effectively lead to impunity, given that the exclusive jurisdiction of a contributing state must be viewed in light of that contributing state's ability to prosecute and punish perpetrators of grave crimes, Your Excellency. Have, have, has your country ever considered this particular possibility that if um, the nationals of Arkham were returned to their country and they were not prosecuted or investigated, that the Security Council might itself decide, because it has um, an agreement with your country in relation to um, the uh, personnel who are sent to the war zone. That if, if they decided that there was no genuine 
investigation or prosecution in Arkham, they might refer the case themselves to the International Criminal Court. Have you considered that? In your, in your position of wanting to send um, the two suspects to the ICC? Certainly, Your Excellency. The Security Council is empowered to embark upon that course of action. However, what must be stressed is that Randolph, in the present case, is seeking to surrender Cohen to the International Criminal Court. Repatriating Cohen back to Arkham right now would leave us in a sticky situation. Given Why do you say that, considering the assurances that we received from the two previous speakers that they were going to do nothing that would um, engender impunity and they were going to make these two people accountable if they accepted the crimes had, committed, or had been committed? They accepted that these were crimes of grave concern and they accepted that they were matters which warranted um, accountability. Um, why are you so insistent on not giving Arkham the opportunity to show their bona fides in an investigation and in a prosecution? Your Excellency, indeed, agents for the applicant have asserted that they are serious in investigating and prosecuting Cullen. They have, in fact, acknowledged that they may have an obligation to prosecute Cohen. However, Your Excellencies, from the facts, it is unclear how they arrived at this assertion. Your Excellencies, this would, in fact, lead me to my second argument. Arkham has not commenced any genuine investigation over Joseph Cohen. Your Excellencies, the Rome Statute itself recognizes the principle of complementarity as a cornerstone. It thus defers investigation investigations to national criminal jurisdictions. Arkham, however, has embarked upon a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It is the state of Randolph's submission that Arkham is unwilling to genuinely investigate. In deciding the unwillingness in a particular case, this court can have regard to Article 17.2 of the Rome Statute. Which Counsel, excuse the interruption. It seems to me that the TRC statute uh, establishes precisely the mechanism for determining the facts as to whether or not to proceed with a prosecution or not. And you seem to be negating that which the TRC law contains. Uh, did I misunderstand you? No, Your Excellency. However, it must be stressed that the Arcane TRC contains many irregularities, procedural and substantive. While they assert that it is modeled after the South African TRC, and that the South African TRC could recommend prosecutions. In this regard, it must be stressed the difference in the amnesty granting power. While the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission could only grant an amnesty to acts associated with the political objective, the amnesty granting power of the Arcane Truth and Reconciliation Commission, on the other hand, may grant an amnesty to any act of which an individual is accused. Furthermore, Your Excellencies, it is unclear from the facts if the Arkham and TRC may indeed recommend prosecutions in appropriate cases. All that we do know is that in the past four months, they have granted 11 amnesties. Furthermore, it- Counsel, if I may interrupt you, um, aren't you then premature uh, in, in this matter? Uh, shouldn't, um, shouldn't they have the opportunity to investigate and then if there are enough facts to prosecute, and only if they commit a violation of the principal accountability would you then be in a position to make the claims you are presently making? Mr. President, in response to your concern, I have two points to make. First, it must be highlight, highlighted the difficult situation if indeed we allowed Arkham Akram to carry on with this investigation. If Cohen were repatriated to Arkham, Akram, with this objection to the Rome Statute, would certainly not agree to subsequently surrender Cohen to the International Criminal Court upon and if an amnesty is granted to Cohen. In any case, Your Excellencies, the principal objection that the state of Randolphia has to the Argument Truth and Reconciliation Commission is that it does not fit within the complementarity regime in the Rome Statute. Article 17 itself makes express reference to paragraph 10 of the preamble of the Rome Statute and Article 1 of the Rome Statute. It is thus complementary to national criminal jurisdictions. Arkham and TRC is a non-judicial body, is an administrative body with no prosecutorial powers. It cannot be asserted that they are serious in investigating or prosecuting Cohen Your Excellencies. Uh, uh, sorry. Please. 
are you uh, claiming that in general terms a truth and reconciliation commission would not come under Article 17 or just in this specific case? It is a state of end office position that the al and TRC would not fit within the complementarity regime. While during the Rome negotiations, certainly there was recognition that certain alternative dispute mechanisms may be acceptable, there was no express recognition of truth and reconciliation commissions. In fact, South Africa did indeed pursue its interest in its truth and reconciliation commission during the drafting stages. However, Your Excellencies, what must be stressed is that in certain circumstances, the International Criminal Court may defer to a truth and reconciliation commission. In the present case, there are numerous irregularities. First, Your Excellencies, it must be highlighted that Cohen was part of a United Nations authorized multilateral force. The crimes were committed in length. It is hard to see how the investigation of Cohen by the Arcamian Truth and Reconciliation Commission has any bearing at all to the purpose of healing and reconciliation in Arkham. It is doubtful of their serious intent to investigate Cohen for the purposes of healing in Arkham, Your Excellencies. Yes, Counsel. Does, uh, does your government has an army? Do you have an army? Yes, Your Excellency. Do you have a military code? Certainly, yes. Does the military code in your country provide for the military to investigate officers who commit a violation of military law? From the company, it is unclear and I'm unable to provide you with a precise answer, but I presume so, yes. Hypothetically, if you have a government that has a military code which provides that an officer is appointed to investigate before a court-martial is convened, uh, would you consider that a uh, valid exercise of complementarity, or would you also say that this is irregular? In the case that Mr. President, Your Excellency has pointed out, certainly it may be a valid exercise of the complementarity because it is possible that a prosecution could ensue upon a genuine investigation. However, Your Excellencies, bringing it back to the facts of this case and what Arkham and its Truth and Reconciliation Commission have done, certainly any intention to genuinely investigate Cohen with a view to possible prosecution may not be inferred from the compromise, Your Excellencies. It is thus submitted. But, but we don't know that. I mean, this is speculation at this point. Certainly. Yes. I mean, do you have anything more than your speculation that the eventual outcome will be what you seem to intimate, which is a whitewash? Your Excellency, I'm un unable to give you a precise and definitive answer as to the activities of the Arkham TRC. However, I may highlight to this court numerous facts that give rise to the inference that Arkham is unwilling to genuinely investigate. Another fact that must be highlighted is the composition of the tribunal. Given the fact that the Arkham and Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established to promote healing and reconciliation among ethnic Lanians and ethnic Arkhamians, given the fact that the composition comprises entirely of ethnic Arkhamians, this immediately gives rise to certain objections. So are well, you saying that the alleged crimes of Mr. Cohen are totally outside the ambit and purpose of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Arkham? You're suspicious. And I, I, I noticed something that I heard nothing from either side so far, apart from the fact that it's modeled on the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, no mention whatever of the role of victims. How do you suppose that the victims of the alleged massacre in Lang or you got, are going to be had in Arkham, or do you know? Is that, does this form part of your concern? Certainly, Your Excellencies, it does. And the state of red law is suspicious of the Arkham and Truth and Reconciliation activities. Given the fact that there is no provision for how the victims may be heard, given the fact that they seek to investigate Cohen, who is part of a United Nations authorized force, and given the fact that there exist all these other factors that suggest Arkham's unwillingness it is the state of Randolph's position that Arkham is unwilling to genuinely investigate Cohen. It may thus not fall within the complementarity regime in Article 17 of the Rome Statute. Thus, Your Excellencies, Randolph's decision to surrender Cohen to the International Criminal Court would not be rendered illegal under international law. Your Excellencies, if I may move on to my third argument. The ICC's exercise of jurisdiction 
over Joseph Cohen is consistent with customary international law and the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, even though Cohen is a national of a non-party state. Your Excellencies, Article 12.2a of the Rome Statute provides the ICC with jurisdiction where the conduct in question occurred on the territory of a state party. The ICC is in effect exercising the state's territorial jurisdiction. The territorial state has decided to complement its jurisdiction with the ICC in instances where it is unwilling or unable to do so. Your Excellencies, this is based upon, this jurisdictional regime is based upon the well-established principle of territorial jurisdiction. Any argument that the ICC's jurisdiction is unknown to international law or violates customary international law cannot be entertained, Your Excellencies. Your Excellencies, in this regard, it must be stated that agent for the applicant has asserted that it would not object to link the territorial state exercising jurisdiction. However, they have asserted that it would object to the ICC exercising jurisdiction. This assertion is unjustified. The rationale for territorial jurisdiction is not lost merely because we are talking about a tribunal on the one hand and a state on the other. In fact, the International Criminal Court provides an elaborate procedure of cooperation between the territorial state and the International Criminal Court. This is reflected in Part 9 of the Rome Statute. It provides for obligations of cooperation, transfer of witness, transfer of evidence, search and seizure, executions. Thus, Your Excellencies, it may not be asserted that the International Criminal Court, in asserting jurisdiction over a national of a non-party state, violates any customary international law. Moving on to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties argument, Your Excellencies, agents for the applicant have asserted that the Rome Statute imposes obligations on outcome. Your Excellencies, Article 34 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties provides that a treaty does not create obligations on third states without their consent. The Rome Statute only imposes obligations upon state parties, as I've mentioned earlier in Part 9 of the Rome Statute. It does not purport to impose any obligation on states not parties to the Rome Statute. This argument by the applicants that it does indeed impose an obligation blurs the important distinction between a state and its national. If indeed the applicants can assert that it would not object to length territorial jurisdiction, it is doubtful to see how, if objecting to the ICC's jurisdiction, an obligation is imp imposed upon the state of Arkham, the Kingdom of Arkham, Your Excellencies. Thus, it is submitted that the ICC's exercise of jurisdiction over Joseph Cohen is consistent with customary international law and the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. It is thus further submitted that Randolph's decision to surrender Joseph Cohen to the International Criminal Court would be consistent with international law. Your Excellencies, if I may move on, move back to my Security uh, Council point. Sorry, Your sorry, Council, is that your point that since uh, Arkham does not object to Lang's exercising jurisdiction, uh, Lang's is entitled to transfer jurisdiction to, to any other country, including the ICC? Your Excellencies, I understand your concern. However, the delegation of transfer by link to a, another tribunal is another issue. Here we are concerned with 139 states coming together and forming an international criminal court based upon the well-established principle of territorial jurisdiction. If indeed link were to transfer an Archimian national to any other state, that would form a new form of jurisdiction. However, the ICC is merely exercising the state's territorial jurisdiction. And as I've mentioned earlier, Due to the elaborate procedures of cooperation between the territorial state and the International Criminal Court, any argument that the ICC may not exercise jurisdiction over Cohen may not be justified, Your Excellencies. <coughs> Your Excellencies, moving on, moving back to my Security Council argument, it must also be highlighted that one of the fears that the applicant has raised with regards to Resolution 1497 adopted by the Security Council is that the inclusion of operative paragraph 7 is essential for peacekeeping forces. It is acknowledged that in Resolution 1497, the United States insisted on the inclusion of operative paragraph 7. However, it must be stressed that operative paragraph 7, in effect, constitutes a bilateral immunity agreement. The Security Council, in adopting operative paragraph 7 and Resolution 2241, is in effect 
concluding a bilateral immunity agreement between a contributing state and the entire world, Excellencies. Prior to the vote on Resolution 1497, the United States ambassadors to the United Nations stated that the reason that they pushed for the inclusion of operative paragraph 7 in Resolution 1497 was that the Liberian government was non-existent and that they were not able to enter into a bilateral immunity agreement with Liberia. Subsequently, Your Excellencies, the United States has in fact entered into a bilateral immunity agreement with Liberia. Thus, Your Excellencies, it is submitted that operative paragraph 7 of Resolution 2341, apart from perhaps leading to the impunity, also is not necessary for peacekeeping forces. For the reason... Yes, so, excuse me. Are you uh, suggesting that um, the United States imposed its will on the Security Council here? Mr. President, I understand your concern. However, the United States insisted on the inclusion of Operative Paragraph 7 as a threat of a, a veto of all future peacekeeping operations. And given the compelling situation in Liberia, the resolution was adopted amidst objections by numerous other states, Mr. President. So in your mind, does this taint the Security Council's resolution? Your Excellency, the state of Randolphia does not wish to speculate on this. However, it must be borne in mind that in the present case, we are concerned with Randolphia's decision to surrender Cohen to the International Criminal Court. In this regard, given that Operative Paragraph 7 is not necessary for the authorization of multilateral forces, and given that the application of Operative Paragraph 7, I see that my time has expired, may I just respond? Please. Given that the application of Operative Paragraph 7 would effectively lead to the impunity of Cohen, it is submitted that Randolph's decision to surrender Cohen to the International Criminal Court would be entirely consistent with international law. Counsel, last question. Is, is it your contention that the statute of the ICC uh, intended to give the Security Council uh, the latitude of passing on future uh, immunity resolutions such as this one or not? Certainly not, Your Excellencies. In fact, within the Rome Statute, there is provision for an effective deferral of investigations by the International Criminal Court. This is reflected in Article 16 of the Rome Statute. In the present case, Resolution 2241 was not an attempt by the Security Council to act in conformity with Article 16. It exceeds Article 16 and, in effect, constitutes a permanent deferral from the ICC's jurisdiction. And Thank you, you, you contend that this is what? In violation of the Security Council's uh, powers? Or what is your conclusion on that? Your Excellency, it cannot be contended merely because the Security Council does not act in conformity with the Rome Statute that it is acting ultra-virus the Charter. The State of Randolph acknowledges the wide discretion that the Security Council has. However, as I've early men earlier mentioned, the Security Council, in adopting Resolution 2241, has violated the purposes and principles of the Charter. It must be stressed in this regard, Your Excellencies, that today the, the drive for justice is, is an integral part of the quest for international peace. So much was recognized by Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Your Excellencies. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Excellencies. My name is Melanie Chen, and I appear as co-agent for the respondent, the State of Randolphia. I will be addressing this call on the second issue, that relating to the legality of Randolphia's decision to surrender Herbert West to the International Criminal Court. Your Excellencies, Herbert West is a leader of the Greater Arcanian Liberation Army. He is the author of a recording in which he called upon his Arcanian brothers and sisters to rid Yugoth of its Lingian occupiers. In this recording, Herbert West further went on to state, and I quote, Eliminate them all, men, women, and children. Eliminate them all. Herbert West has been charged for genocide-related crimes by the International Criminal Court. <coughs> it is the state of Randolphia's submission that its decision to surrender Herbert West would be consistent with international law as the ICC's exercise of jurisdiction over Herbert West is consistent with the Rome Statute. In support Council, if I may interrupt. Um, yes, the, the applicant uh, made an argument to the effect that uh, to eliminate them all did not 
have any genocidal intent, but had a territorial significance. Could you enlighten us on your position on this argument? Yes, Your Excellency. It is submitted that the words eliminate them all clearly reveal a genocidal intent, namely an intent to destroy in whole or in part an ethnic group. In the present case, uh, Lingyans are clearly an ethnic group. Admittedly, the, the elimination of Lingyans was part of the political agenda of the Greater Arcanian Liberation Army. However, isn't, isn't the argument that you have to face, if I understand it correctly, as it was presented by the Arkham um, agents, was that the, the intention was not to eliminate the Lengians or to kill them, it was to eliminate people who stood in the way of territorial aims, and therefore the intent to commit genocide was absent because it was in order to ethnically clean the lands rather than to kill them because they were part of the group. I must say, I didn't find the argument very convincing, but I just wonder what you have to say about it. Your Excellency, it is submitted that this distinction is an artificial one. The fact that they had the intention to eliminate Lingians, albeit pursuant to a political agenda, does not detract from the fact that they had this intention. In addition, Your Excellencies, Agent for Africa earlier referred to the case of Prosecutor Anahimana. And if I recite a paragraph from that very case, it was stated that the association of Tutsi ethnic groups with a political agenda, effectively merging ethnic and political identity, does not negate the genocidal animus that motivated the accused. Therefore, Your Excellencies, it is submitted that in the present case, the words eliminate them all clearly do evidence a genocidal intent. Your Excellencies, if I may now proceed to outline my three submissions before this court today. Firstly, it is submitted that the preconditions to the ICC's exercise of jurisdiction are satisfied in the present case. Our second submission is that the ICC has jurisdiction over Herbert West's alleged crimes as these were committed after the Rome Statute entered into force or link the relevant state in question. Our third submission is that there are reasonable grounds to conclude that Herbert West committed a crime within the ICC's jurisdiction. Moving on to my first submission. Your Excellencies, the Rome Statute states that one of two preconditions must be satisfied before the ICC can exercise jurisdiction. It is the state of Randolphia's submission that the precondition stated under Article 12.2a is satisfied in the present case. Article 12.2a states that the conduct in question must have occurred on the territory of a state party. Your Excellencies, in the present case, the conduct in question, which comprises of the charge of incitement to genocide against Herbert West, comprises not only of his act of making the recording and handing it to a fellow gala member, but also the subsequent circulation and broadcast of this recording. The ICC is seeking to hold Herbert West responsible, not only for making the recording, but also for the subsequent circulation and broadcast. Therefore, Your Excellencies, it is submitted that these events together form the conduct in question. Admittedly, part of this conduct in question occurred outside the territory of a state party to the Rome Statute. Nevertheless, it is submitted that Article 12.2a is satisfied where part of the conduct occurred on the territory of a state party. Your Excellencies, this interpretation of Article 12.2a is consistent with well-established principles of territorial jurisdiction. According to the objective territorial principle at international law, a crime is committed on the territory of a state when part of the conduct which constitutes the crime occurred on this territory. Accordingly, Your Excellencies, in the present case, even though only part of the conduct occurred on the territory of Ling, um, it is submitted that Ling does have territorial jurisdiction, and accordingly, given that Ling is a state party to the Rome Statute, the ICC also... Counsel, what would be exactly the part of the conduct occurred uh, on the territory of Ling? Your Excellency, it is submitted that the part of the conduct which occurred on Ling was the circulation and the broadcast of this recording. And it is this um, conduct which the ICC seeks to hold Herbert West responsible for. Um, which is uh, the link you make between the uh, preparation of the tape, the giving the tape to the person, and the circulation? Your Excellencies, it is submitted that in the present case, 
Admittedly, on the facts, um, there is no evidence that Herbert West <coughs> issued an, uh, specific instructions as to what use was to be made of this tape. However, it is submitted that given the circumstances surrounding these facts, it was unnecessary for him to give any instructions. What use was to be made of the tape was clear, Your Excellencies. Your Excellency. Is, your, is that your position that it was clear because uh, the, Dr. West was the commander of Gala? and therefore he had a command responsibility over, over all the people in Gala that uh, broadcasted the tape? Your Excellency, it is submitted that Herbert West's conduct does um, constitute a crime according to this doctrine of superior responsibility. But in addition to that, there are also reasonable grounds to conclude that he is responsible individually for direct and public incitement to genocide. Your Excellency, in addition to the fact that Herbert West is a leader of GALA and that he handed this recording to a fellow GALA member, it must also be highlighted that this recording fell directly within GALA's goals to obtain the unification of UGOT with Ling. And particularly, Your Excellency, this recording was addressed to a general audience, namely his Arcanian brothers and sisters. In handing this tape to a fellow Gala member, Your Excellency, it is submitted that instructions were unnecessary. It was clear what use was to be made. In addition, this tape was made and was handed to a fellow Gala member at a time when Gala was supporting ethnic Arcanians in an ethnic conflict with Lingians within Yugot itself. Your Excellency, given that this tape recording referred particularly to Yugot and called upon his Arcanian brothers and sisters to eliminate uh, Yugot of its Lingian occupiers, it is submitted that clearly Herbert West did have this intention for his recording to be put to subsequent use within the territory of Yugot itself. Counsel, the, the tape, I believe, was made prior to the temporal jurisdiction of the ICC, wasn't it? Yes, Your Excellency. How then can we find the basis for the application of the ICC's jurisdiction? Your Excellency, it is submitted that in determining whether the ICC has jurisdiction over this alleged crime, the relevant provision of the Rome Statute may be able to provide some assistance. The relevant provision is Article 11.2 of the Rome Statute. Article 11.2 states that the ICC has jurisdiction over crimes committed after the entry into force of the Rome Statute for the relevant state in question. And in the present case, the relevant state in question is Ling. And so what, what is the crime here? Is the crime the making of the tape or the broadcast of the tape? Your Excellency, the, the crime which the ICC seeks to hold Herbert West responsible for um, are the broadcasts. And Your Excellency, it is submitted. It's the broadcast. Your Excellencies, it is submitted that the ICC seeks to hold Herbert West responsible for the broadcast um, due to his act of making this recording and handing it to a fellow GALA member. Your Excellencies, given the circumstances surrounding which these occurred, it is submitted that Herbert West must be held responsible for the consequences of his actions, namely the broadcast, which he knew and... May I interrupt? Let's assume that Dr. West made this broadcast 10 years ago and gave it to one of the members of his party, who 10 years later decided to interpret the spirit of what Dr. West wanted and broadcasted it. Would you contend that Dr. West should still be held responsible for that? Your Excellency, in that situation, it, um, it would appear that that person would not, or it, it may be more difficult to draw a conclusion of intention as the circumstances in which the recording in that situation were ultimately broadcast would be very different from the situation in which the person originally made the recording um, as there was a time gap of 10 years. However, Your Excellency, that situation must be contrasted with that of the present case. In the present case, when Herbert West made this recording, Gala was already supporting an ongoing ethnic conflict between Arcanians and Lingians within Yugot. In addition, Your Excellency, Your Excellency, the time difference was only that of one month, which stands in a very great distinction with the situation of 10 years. Therefore, Your Excellency, it is submitted that in the present case, there are indeed reasonable grounds to conclude that Herbert West has committed this crime of direct and public. Yes, Your Excellency. Just isn't the point, or one of the points that the um, applicant is making, a very narrow one, and that is that the ICC has no jurisdiction 
because Leng didn't actually sign up to the treaty until after the alleged crimes had occurred, if you call the making of the recording an integral part of the crime that's alleged. If, if it is established that part of the link was committed outside the time frame, wouldn't you have to accept that possibly the ICC had no jurisdiction, no temporal jurisdiction? Your Excellency, it is submitted that um, notwithstanding the fact that the making of the recording occurred prior to May 2003, ICC still has jurisdiction. This is because the alleged crime of direct and public incitement only occurred or was only committed when the broadcast occurred. And these broadcasts occurred from May 15 to May 25, 2003. So do you say that the making of the recording before May is irrelevant? Your Excellency, admittedly, the making of the recording is relevant. However, it is submitted that the ICC, in holding Herbert or in attempting to hold Herbert West responsible for a crime which was committed after May, is not precluded from having reliance on events prior to that date. And Your Excellency, uh, some authority can be derived from the jurisprudence of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. In the case of the ICTR, the temporal jurisdiction of the ICTR was limited to, um, in a manner similar to that of the ICC. Namely, the ICTR had, uh, had jurisdiction over crimes committed uh, after 1st January 1994. And Your Excellencies, in the case of Prosecutor and Nahimana, which was subsequently affirmed in the case of Prosecutor and Kajeli Jelly, the ICTR stated that the tribunal's temporal jurisdiction is not exceeded as long as the trial chamber does not rely on events occurring prior to 1994 as the independent basis of account. Your Excellencies, accordingly it is submitted that in the present case, the ICC has not exceeded its temporal jurisdiction as it is not relying on events prior to 1st May as the independent basis of account. Uh, Counsel, then you mean that the independent basis for the crime is the circulation of the tape? Your Excellency, uh, it is submitted. Essentially. I apologize. Your Excellency, it is submitted that the broadcast of the tape does not form the independent basis of the count. However, uh, the, the, the basis or what forms the basis of the count are the ultimate broadcast in culmination with his act of making the recording and handing it to his neighbor. However, Your Excellency, similarly, it cannot be said that his act of making the recording and handing it to his neighbour uh, formed the independent basis of the charge either. And accordingly, it is submitted that the ICC has not exceeded its temporal jurisdiction according to Article... Counsel, don't you think this thesis you are explaining now uh, is uh, uh, somewhat in contradiction with uh, what you said about uh, superior responsibility? Your Excellency, um, I believe... Because command responsibility would not require... Uh, now we are trying to put, a, a, seems to me, a link, a direct link in the conduct, a continuing conduct, starting before the entry into force of the treaty, of the statute, and what uh, happened subsequently. Uh, earlier, it seemed to me, you were uh, uh, claiming that uh, Dr. West... Uh, was responsible for superior responsibility, and that's committed by others after the after the the um, the entry into force of the treaty. That would mean that his responsibility would depend on his failure to prevent or to punish his subordinates. Your Excellency, I apologize for not making myself clear. Um, in the present case, Herbert West has been charged both uh, pursuant to the doctrine of superior responsibility as well as for being individually criminally responsible for direct and public incitement to genocide. And it is the state of the dogged submission that there are reasonable grounds to conclude that Dr. Herbert West has, uh, is responsible under the doctrine of superior responsibility as, and there are also reasonable grounds to conclude that he, has, he is individually criminally responsible for the crime of direct and public incitement to genocide, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, accordingly it is submitted that the ICC has not exceeded its temporal jurisdiction. Moving on to my third submission, Your Excellencies, it is submitted that in the present case there are reasonable grounds to conclude that Herbert West has committed a crime within the jurisdiction of the court. 
Your Excellencies, at the outset, it must be stressed that this court is not dealing with the merits of the case against Herbert West, but indeed dealing with whether the ICC's exercise of jurisdiction over Herbert West has been lawful. And it is submitted that the standard that is to be applied is that of reasonableness. This is because, according to Article 58 of the Rome Statute, the ICC can issue an arrest warrant where there are reasonable grounds to believe that the person has committed a crime within the jurisdiction of the court. Accordingly, Your Excellencies, provided that there are reasonable grounds to believe that Herbert West has committed a crime, this arrest warrant would have been lawfully issued, and Radolfi's decision to surrender Herbert West pursuant to this arrest warrant would similarly be lawful. Your Excellencies, I will first address uh, the charge against Herbert West for superior responsibility. Your Excellencies, in order for Herbert West to be liable under this doctrine, it must be shown that he was the superior of the, the persons or the Gala members in Radio Yugoth who broadcast the recording. Your Excellencies, Gala is a militia which is organised in a formal hierarchy. It is submitted that Herbert West, in his position as a leader of Gala, would indeed have been the superior of the, first, of the, of the Gala members in Radio Yugot. Your Excellencies, in the case of Prosecutor and Lawrence Samanza, which was decided by the ICTR, it was stated that a superior subordinate relationship requires a hierarchical relationship where a superior is senior to a subordinate. Your Excellencies, Herbert West's relationship with the Gala members in Radio Yugot clearly satisfies this criteria given that Gala was organised in a formal hierarchy and that Herbert West was a leader of Gala. Clearly, he would have had a hierarchical relationship and would have been senior to the Gala members in Radio Yugot. Your Excellencies, in addition, it is submitted uh, that another requirement to establish superior responsibility is that of effective control. However, it must be stressed that in the case of prosecutor and Delali, the accused chief... Counsel, before you proceed, is there a difference in your mind between the doctrine of command responsibility under the law of armed conflict and uh, what you refer to as superior responsibility? Your Excellency, it is submitted that um, the Rome Statute deals with it, uh, deals with um, two different types of superior responsibility, and I apologize for not making myself clear, but when I refer to superior responsibility, I was actually referring to both forms of responsibility under Article 28 of the Rome Statute, which also includes um, the, the responsibility which Your Excellency referred to, namely that in times of armed conflict, or namely that exercised by a military commander. But yeah. the point that I'm trying to make, excuse me, is that in, in the doctrine of command responsibility, there is the assumption that the superior officer not only stands in a hierarchical position, but has a coercive authority. In relationships between civilians working together, there may be a hierarchical relationship but it does not necessarily imply that there is a coercive authority. How do we reach the conclusion that a political civilian leader uh, is necessarily responsible for the acts of uh, subordinates who may not be in a position where they fear his coercive powers? Your Excellency, it is I, I believe Your Excellency to be referring to the requirement of effective control. Your Excellency, it is submitted that in the present case, there are reasonable grounds to conclude that Herbert West had effective control over these Gala members. Your Excellency, admittedly, Gala is divided into military and political organs. However, what must be stressed is that there is no clear division between these organs and that Gala is organised in a formal hierarchy. Your Excellency, it is submitted that Herbert West, in his position as a leader of Gala, would have had authority over Gala members falling below him in this formal hierarchy. Your Excellency, in addition, in the case of Prosecutor and Delalic, the Appeals Chamber of the ICTY stated that a court may presume that possession of de jure power prima facie results in effective control unless proof to the contrary is shown. Your Excellencies, in the present case, it is submitted that given the structure of Gala and given that West was a leader of Gala, and uh, therefore it can be, 
I, I apologize, Your Excellencies. I see that I, I, my time is up. Can I just ask you one question? Do you yes. really have to go that far? Do you have to go to deal with command responsibility de jure or de facto at all, seeing the objection of the um, applicant mm -hmm. is to whether the crime with which he has been charged or the activities which are alleged against him constitute a crime at all. I don't think they, they, do, they enter into the deep and murky waters of command responsibility. Do you, have to, you don't have to go as far as you're going. Yes, Your Excellency. Um, it is submitted that um, notwithstanding, the fact that the, notwithstanding that the applicant did not go into this, um, it is the state of Randolph's submission that there are reasonable grounds to conclude that he has or he is liable under this doctrine and it is the state of Randolph's submission that based on the facts just submitted, these clearly do support the conclusion that there are reasonable grounds. For inferring that a crime within the jurisdiction of the court has been committed, i.e. incitement to genocide. But I was just thinking, you're, you're going very deeply into areas that you don't necessarily have to address, but. Yes, I, I apologize. No, no, don't apologize. <laughs> it's an interesting argument, but a difficult one when you could um, rely on your earlier argument that you made that it is a, it is a crime within the jurisdiction of the court. Yes, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, good afternoon once again. Applicant limits the scope of rebuttal to one or two points, Your Excellencies. First, on the principle of complementarity, respondent contends that this is consistent with the principle of complementarity because prosecution is the only remedy. That investigation to be allowable under the room statute must be criminal. This is not correct. Even under Article 17, Paragraph 1b, an investigation without prosecution may suffice, and the ICC's jurisdiction will be barred in that case. Article 53 provides further that ICC investigators or prosecutors' investigation must be stopped or may be stopped when it would not best serve the interests of justice. The Excellencies and Lofia says that the Arcanian TRC fails the test of complementarity because it is an administrative body. But at the same time, they say, that the South African PRC is consistent with international law. This lies here, the current, the inherent contradiction. Because the South African TRC is an administrative body and was never given the powers of prosecution under international law. The Excellency's accountability is not equivalent to prosecution, and accountability may take on various forms, such as reparations and rehabilitation for human rights victims, public naming of perpetrators, investigation, and prosecution in case of a denial of amnesty. What authority do you have for the proposition that accountability doesn't mean prosecution? Your Excellencies, the highly qualified publicists such as Arsanjani, Bashumi, Your Excellencies, and other Bahrain, and other highly qualified publicists, Your Excellencies, say that accountability is not the only remedy dealing with violations of serious international humanitarian law. Second, Your Excellencies, they raise the issue that the Inahimana case is clear proof that the temporal jurisdiction of the ICC is met. However, Your Excellencies in Nahimana, the pre-1994 acts were only taken into consideration because they were repeated after the 1994 broadcast of the Kangbuga newspaper or circulated afterwards. This only evidenced the intent, Your Excellencies, that in that case, the perpetrators had the intent to systematically annihilate the Tusi population because they were, Your Excellencies, belong to that ethnic group. Your Excellencies, applicant contends that the issue of jurisdiction is the issue presented before the court today. But it's also the issue of whether an effective remedy exists in our court. An applicant would end where it began. Justice must be served. Impunity must be arrested. But the rule of international law, Pacta Tertius, Security Council Resolution 2241, the United Nations Charter System, and the sovereign equality of states must remain Paranormal. Your Excellencies, that concludes our presentation, and we submit the resolution of this dispute for this honorable court. Your Excellencies, Mr. President, I thank this court for its time and indulgence, and it pleases the court. Thank you.
we'll stay away from command responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Excellencies, in Sir Rebuttal, I have two points. My first point is re in response to the principle of complementarity, which was raised by agent for the applicant. Your Excellencies, agent for the applicant contends that the activities of the TRC fall within the meaning of investigation in Article 17. However, Your Excellencies, it must be stressed that in Article 17, it, it itself makes reference to Article 1 and Paragraph 10 of the preamble to the Rome Statute. And this states clearly, Your Excellencies, that the ICC is to be complementary to national criminal jurisdictions. It is, Your Excellencies, it cannot be said that an investigation by a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is a fact-finding activity, falls within the national criminal jurisdiction of ARCA. Your Excellencies, accordingly, it is submitted that the case is admissible before the ICC in the present case. Your Excellencies, my second point in Sir Rebuttal is in response to the point raised regarding the temporal jurisdiction. Your Excellencies, it is submitted that the ICC can have regard to pre-May events and authority from, for this can be derived from the case of pro Prosecutor and Bargo Sora decided by the ICTR. In that case, the trial chamber of the ICTR said that the court could have regard to evidence prior to 1994, which show an ongoing criminal event that began prior to 1994, but whose object was only, rely, well, only realized after that date. According to your excellencies, it is submitted that the ICC has not acted in excess of its temporal jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, from the amount of applause that we heard there, there must have been a lot of uh, winners and uh, successful trophy getters. Um, obviously, the fact that these two teams reached uh, the point that they have now reached uh, means that they are exceptional. Um, and being uh, so exceptional, uh, it becomes obviously extremely difficult to make a choice uh, as, uh, as between uh, the two teams. <coughs> However, we thought, uh, and hopefully we are not prolonging the suspense too much, uh, that we would uh, first start by uh, expressing to you, the three of us on an individual basis, um, our compliments uh, for your performance uh, and uh, how much we, we appreciated it. Uh, and I'm sure everybody else uh, noted how accomplished uh, you were, both in the presentation of your respective cases in answering questions, um, in, in trying to uh, avoid questions that may throw you off track and getting you back on the main course in your argument, how artful you sometimes were in not answering the questions, uh, and uh, other of uh, your many qualities, uh, keeping in mind, of course, the element of tension and nervousness that you must have gone through. But I have to tell you, uh, on, on my part, uh, and certainly my two distinguished colleagues here, uh, from our collective experience, uh, you, you uh, both of your teams have, have been exceptional in the presentation you have made. And certainly, you're, in the future, going to be a great examples for practicing lawyers uh, for your, your ability. And uh, now. Uh, Judge Maureen will be the first to 
make comments. Thank you. I, I just want to say this is my first ever Jessup competition, and although I've heard about it for quite a while, I had no idea that the standard would be what it was today. I'm absolutely incredulous. Um, I asked a lot of um, interrupting and difficult questions, and on every occasion they were extremely well parried and most of the time answered. Um, I think that both sides were extremely focused on the problems which have a high entertainment value for all of you, I'm sure, but for me, they will probably, fa probably be an early run of what we will face in the next year or two or three. Because before we actually get into the facts of a case or the merits of a case, we're going to have to deal with admissibility issues, jurisdiction and admissibility. And as you probably know, no, I don't say probably, you will know, you all sound so clever, um, every court must satisfy itself that the case that comes before it, whether you're a pretrial, an appellate, or a trial chamber, that the case is an admissible one. You have, um, I think, identified the sort of problems that we'll, we'll face, and you've recognized that the success of the ICC depends very much on the recognition of the primacy of complementarity, of the country where the just as we've been arguing today, where the um, suspect resides or is a national of is the country with the first right to deal and the first obligation to deal with, with the crimes. The recognition of complementarity is obviously also the biggest challenge that faces the court because um, it's hard to know whether Arkham really believed in complementarity or whether it was abusing complementarity. And similarly, these are all issues that, that will have to be faced up by the court on a case-by-case -case basis until there's, until there's um, a real set of rules and a jurisprudence. I have to say again that the standard of speaking today was such that I have not heard in debating societies or even young lawyers and I haven't any doubt that each one of you individually will turn out to be famous advocates and will probably appear before me in court in due course, not as a suspect, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it has given me an enormous added pleasure to see that two of the speakers were women. And um, it was a lonely old place when I started as a barrister for women. I had blue-suited and black-suited men all around me, so I thought the only way to beat them was to join them. And I got a suit, too, with trousers and haven't looked back. But Miss Chang and Miss Guerrero, you were both absolutely fantastic, and I'm proud of you. I've done my best to keep the tension going, and I'll hand over to Judge Pokar. Thank you, Judge Pokar. Well, uh, on my part, I too want uh, to congratulate uh, warmly both teams on their performance uh, here today. Um, like my colleagues have been impressed by the way they have addressed the case, the way they have argued and uh, addressed the issues and the questions that were put by the, by the members of the bench. Uh, it's not easy to argue when you are interrupted every minute or even every 30 seconds. And to keep your plead, pleading going on uh, regularly, especially uh, uh, if you have to deal with a case which showed a certain complexity, was new because such a case was never pleaded before a court in any case, uh, since the ICC for the time being uh, had no case of this kind, the SEJ could not have a case of this kind before, uh, before it. And um, you were able to do it uh, 
having a very short time at your disposal, a short time which is uh, perhaps in conformity with American standards before the Supreme Court, where the arguments have to be kept within a, a few minutes, uh, half an hour, I am told, uh, but not with the standards that are used before international tribunals, where parties have hours and hours and hours to uh, play their case, days even to make their, their arguments. But let me also say that I have been impressed by the way both teams uh, have made use of the existing case law of the ad hoc tribunals um, in dealing with a case that uh, is mainly under the, uh, or uh, was uh, essentially under the statute of the ICC, uh, which is uh, clearly, as far as the crimes are concerned, very similar to the statutes of the two ad hoc tribunals, but it's not exactly the same. And uh, making use of the case law is not uh, very easy in such uh, uh, circumstances. Um, well, let me, let me conclude in, uh, by saying that uh, uh, I will remember these pleadings and that sometimes perhaps I will uh, come to, to wish I had such excellent pleadings in The Hague <laughs> before the tribunal. Um, and certainly I wish uh, all of you a brilliant career as, uh, as counsel before uh, international courts or who knows as judges in international courts. Thank you. Well, we, we assume that behind uh, those who argued are others on the team and faculty advisors and other advisors and we would like to also extend to them uh, our congratulations and, and on behalf of the uh, association Congratulations for the support that, that were given to these teams uh, to reach where they are. And now I'm afraid we have to extend the suspense for a few more seconds until we come down and uh, apparently we are supposed to announce the results from the podium downstairs. So hopefully you'll survive the last uh, three instances. <laughs> Please. We have to go Yes, through? of course, of oh. course, of course. All right, we are told that the uh, uh, first to receive uh, the award is the best oralist, and uh, we are pleased to announce unanimously uh, the best oralist to be Mr. Shankar. So pleased to announce that our unanimous decision is for the applicant. <laughs> <laughs>